will get together at Sunday morning. So if you'll turn to Matthew chapter 8. We're going to talk today about Jesus' desire to heal. Matthew chapter 8, verse 1. When Jesus came down from the mountain, large crowds followed him. And a leper came to him and bowed down before him and said, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. And Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him, saying, I am willing to be cleansed. And immediately his leprosy was cleansed. You know, this is such a common statement. So not melodramatic because we don't really understand leprosy. Leprosy ate your body away. Starting with your fingertips and your nose and your toes, your body started to eat up. And in that instant, he said, if you were willing, you can. And he said, I am willing. Now, if you and I had never had any religion of fear interfere with our thinking, that would have been the end of the question, is God willing to heal? Because all you would have to do is take that one scripture where Jesus said, I'm willing. And put it together with the scripture where Jesus said, after chapter, or the Lord said through Peter, he said, God is no respecter of persons. How many of you know God is no respecter of persons? He doesn't love me more than you or you more than me. He's no respecter of persons. Well, if he loved that leper enough to get that vile disease off of him, he loves you enough to get whatever you got off of you. Amen? Amen. But because religion has interfered with our thinking, we're going to spend the whole day or the whole morning, or a few minutes, most of it at least, not the whole morning. Either. Okay, well, here's what we're going to do. We're going to talk about his desire to heal. We're going to talk about why we believe in the laying on the hands. We're going to get a twofer, okay? Hallelujah. Right. So in the first three verses, he heals the leper. Look at verse 5. And when Jesus entered the prey, a centurion came to him, imploring him, saying, Lord, my servant is lying paralyzed at home, fearfully tormented. Now, centurion's a very important man. He must have loved this servant a lot. Well, Jesus said, I'll come heal him. Now, Think about that. The centurion goes on to say, it's not necessary for me to come. Just speak the word and he'll be healed. Jesus loved that. But what I want you to notice that in verse 6, he doesn't even ask him to do anything. He just says, my servant's at home, paralyzed and suffering. And what does Jesus say? I'll come. Uh, now, does that sound like a reluctant healer to you? No, this is somebody who loves to heal because he loves people. This is Jesus' immediate response, I will heal. Why would a busy man like Jesus volunteer to go out of his way to heal a paralyzed servant? Everybody say, he wanted to. I know if you were here last week, we looked through the whole Old Testament, and you said, why would he heal Naaman? Because he wanted to. And you said, why is it so important? Because the next time that you need faith for healing, the first question is not whether he has the power. How many of you know that if he could put the universe together, he could put you back together and heal you like that? That is not the issue. The issue is, does he want to? Now, Jesus was even more excited when a centurion had faith in the word's ability to heal, but he was willing to meet that man on the level of his faith. He didn't know he had that kind of faith. He said, I've never encountered this kind of faith before. Most people said, like Jairus, my daughter is dying, but if you will lay hands on her, she will live. And Jesus said, I'll come. When this man said, my servant's sick, Jesus said, I'll come. Because he didn't know anybody, he hadn't encountered anybody that knew he could just speak the word. He always exhibited a willingness to meet people at their level of faith. Yeah. Now, I don't know if that makes you excited. My faith isn't always perfect. Maybe yours is. But you always have a level of faith that's far enough along. If you've got enough faith to get you out of the church on a rainy morning, uh -huh. I love rainy mornings. You can always tell who wants to be in church. Yeah. You've got to have the want to to get to church on a rainy morning. All right? And Jesus had the want to. He showed that he wanted to meet this level or this man on whatever level his faith was. Yeah. So look at verse 13. Jesus said to the centurion, Go, it shall be done for you as you believe. And the servant was healed that very moment. I do want to point one thing to you. Was the centurion's faith involved? Yes. yes. Will your faith be involved in your miracle? Yes. Yeah, thank you. See, the first yes was really easy because it was uh, ahead. Somebody else in a done conclusion. And when I, I okay, no, it was, it was an agreement, but not as hearty because all of a sudden we think, oh, what if I don't have the faith? Now, we've already seen that Jesus was willing to meet him wherever his faith was. Your faith will be involved. But then the last question I have on this verse is, 
Was there any arm twisting needed to convince God to heal? Did he have to wheedle? Mm -hmm. No. Okay, next verse. Man, look at here. So far we were in one chapter and we got, he's got the leper healed and the slave that's paralyzed healed. Verse 14. When Jesus came into Peter's home, he saw his mother-in-law lying sick in bed with a fever. So they fasted and prayed for two hours. And finally, is that what it says? Finally, Jesus got in the mood to heal. No, it says he saw his mother, Peter's mother-in-law lying sick in bed with fever. Fever. He touched her hand. She got up and the fever left her. She yeah. got up and waited on him. So do we see a hesitancy, a reluctance on Jesus? No. He, she's hurting. Anybody with that, that kind of high fever is miserable. Instantly, he healed her. What is his response to the servant that's paralyzed? I'll heal her. I'll volunteer to come. High fever, automatic. We'll touch her. Yeah. Jesus was eager to heal. Look at verse 16. So when evening came, you think you can keep news like that to yourself? No, the whole town by this time knows something's going on. When evening came, they brought to him many who were demon-possessed. And he cast out the spirits with a word. And I'm going to read you the 12th verse and the rest of that verse. He divided the sick into two groups. The 85% it was God's will to heal. And the 15% it was not God's will to heal. Is that what it says? That's the 2012 version of many churches. But he didn't divide them into groups. It says he cast out the spirits and he healed how many? All. all. You know what all means in the Greek? All. Yeah, okay. What does the next verse say that Jesus did with our diseases? This was to fulfill what was spoken through Isaiah the prophet. He himself did something to our diseases. I wonder what that means. It means he took them. When he was scourged, he took your diseases. On the cross, he took your sin. And on the, at the scourging post, he took your diseases. We'll show you the verses that lay it out black and white. And you say, well, why hasn't it been taught? I believe most of the reason it hasn't been taught is because of embarrassment. If, if we don't have people getting healed, we'll just say it passed away. It's weak. Yeah, you say, that's a terrible thing to say. I know Word of Faith churches that started out preaching healing. And if one thing... Okay, now we're getting to the hard part. But you can pray for something and it not happen, and that doesn't prove God doesn't, isn't God's way to do it. We have to cooperate. And I believe with all my heart, the better you know God, the easier it is to stay healed. God's will is not for you to get healed. God's best is for you to stay healed. Amen. Okay. Now, it doesn't, it, it, when it says that he took your infirmities and carried away your diseases, for one thing you look and learn from that verse is you don't ever say my arthritis is that thing up. It can't be your arthritis. Jesus took yours. This is the devil's that the devil. Don't ever claim something. And I know you, but I had to be taught this, and I'm not being hard on you. But don't say, well, my diabetes. Do you want it? And you say, what difference does it make? Because death and life in your life is in the power of your tongue. Yeah. Not the pastor's tongue or your brother-in-law's tongue. It's in your tongue. And you must be careful about your words. It's not your cancer. It's not anything. He took yours. This is the devil's, and you have to demand to take it back. Yeah. I'm going to do a three-minute review for those of you who weren't here, and even for those of you who were, I think it will help you. Last week, we took a tour through the Old Testament, and we found that when Naaman, a Syrian general, a leper, asked the prophet to heal him, the prophet told him to go dip seven times as an act of faith. And we didn't go into this very much, but it's, not only was he healed, he didn't have an old man's skin. It says his skin was like a new little baby's skin. Isn't that awesome when we all like to have that? Hallelujah. When King Hezekiah, the king of Judah, was about to die in, the, in Isaiah, Don had said, set your house in order. This is, this is going to be it. He turned his face toward the wall. And in about a five-minute prayer, because Isaiah never got out of the courtyard that day, he said, don't you remember, Lord, how I've tried to lead your people back to me. Have mercy. And with tears he prayed. And before Isaiah ever left the courtyard, the Lord said, turn around and tell him I've had it 15 years. You know why he did that? Because he wanted to. Yeah. He want, He had no obligation to Nam, and he had no covenant with Nam, and he wanted to heal him. Yeah. Like I was going to say, like what I said last week, have you ever tried to make God do something he didn't want to do? <laughs> have fun. I tried. <laughs> you are never going to make God do something he didn't want to do. Because he's God. Guess what? He heals because he wants to. Amen. He loves you. Hallelujah. We saw the only two things you had to do to get healed in the Old Testament was to ask nice and humble yourself. See example after example where they did that. How did they, Hezekiah know? There's about two more minutes of review. Hezekiah, the guy that's 
Isaiah said, okay, you're going to die. He turns his face and says, well, how did he know he could get healed? That nation had been very, very far from God. If you go back and look at the beginning of his revival, they started out by carrying pagan idols out of the Lord's temple. I mean, I'm going to throw up saying that. Can you imagine the holy temple of God? They were so far from God, they had installed idols to Solomon's wives all the way through the centuries. They're far from God. They weren't seeing people healed. How did he know he could pray? Because, and we won't go back and read it, but in 2 Chronicles 30, we'll just read two, two or three verses here. When he called everybody back, there was such a response, they couldn't get everybody ready to take Passover according to the law. There were certain rituals and ceremonies you had to go through to be clean to take the Passover. So look at what Hezekiah prayed. For a multitude of the people, even from Ephraim and Manasseh, Issachar and Zebulun, had not purified themselves yet. They ate the Passover otherwise than prescribed. For Hezekiah prayed for them, saying, May the good Lord pardon Everyone who prepares his heart to seek the Lord, the Lord God of his fathers, although not according to the purification rules of the sanctuary. Say, we're coming back, but we... Did he pray for healing? No. Never mentioned healing. I don't think healing crossed his mind. No. And yet, what happened when God showed up? He healed his people. He is by nature a healer. Yeah. I told you about a revival I went through as a kid, and it was in a church that didn't believe in any of the gifts, but when God showed up, we started seeing one member after another get healed of things we knew that had for years. And you know, after about the fifth time that occurred to us, God must want to do this because we're not asking. <laughs> uh -huh. All right, David says in Psalm 30, I cried to the Lord and he healed me. In Psalm 103, verse 3, he said he heals all our diseases. Just two more, a couple more review. If you remember when Miriam criticized Moses in Numbers chapter 12, Moses cried out and said, Oh Lord, heal her, I pray. And he healed her. Do we see healing over and over? Do you understand? This is not like one time in the whole Old Testament. Over and over, God healed when people ask him to. How did Moses know that he could? Well, in, in Psalm 105, verse 37, New King James, look at this. It says, He, the Lord, brought them, as the children of Israel, He brought them out with silver and gold. And there was not one feeble among his tribes. None feeble. Now, here's what this means. Let's suppose there's a problem with Colonial Beach. We've got to evacuate Colonial Beach. And they decide, we're going to evacuate Colonial Beach to King George, right? But the problem is the cars have not been invented yet. They didn't have cars. And they didn't have any beasts of burden because they were slaves. They didn't have any properties. So that means that we got to get Colonial Beach to King George. Come on. All right? Now, there's a problem with that. In Colonial Beach, we got a lot of retirees. Yeah. But if we didn't, how, how would we get Colonial Beach to King George under our own steam? You know how many people live in Colonial Beach? 3,000. Give or take a few, 3,000. Do you know how many people left Egypt? 3 million. That'd be 1,000 times as many as in Colonial Beach. You'd have to have 1,000 Colonial Beaches, and you'd have to have them leave 100% under their own steam. Are you following me here? I'm not exaggerating. 100% of all the people all walked out. Why? Because when they took the Passover, by faith, God just went ahead and met them because they asked them, Jesus is coming, that Passover represent. He knew they needed it and he healed them. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. And you say, well, how do you know he was the healer to Moses? Look at what Exodus 15, 26. He, the Lord, said through Moses, if you will give earnest heed to the voice of the Lord your God and do what is right in your sight and give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes, I will put none of the diseases on you that I put on the Egyptians. For I am Jehovah Rapha. I am the Lord, your healer. So all the way through the Old Testament, he is the Lord, our healer, over and over. And we're under a better covenant. Now, uh, the clincher is in Malachi 4, the very last prophecy. The last, in fact, if you're in Matthew 8, just turn back a few pages. It's the last page of the Old Testament. The last messianic prophecy before the Messiah shows up. Malachi 4.2 But for you who fear my name, the Son of Righteousness will rise with healing in its or his wings, and you will go forth and skip about like calves from the stall. I heard one interesting observation, this one I wouldn't fight for it, but the rabbis were a prayer shawl. You've probably seen the prayer shawl. And you know how it's kind of billowy? They call those the wings of the prayer shawl. So, you know, is that, I don't know if that's what that prophecy means or not, but one way or the other, when he came, 
He arose with healing in his wings. Because in one chapter, we just read that he healed the leper. He healed the paralyzed centurion slaves. He healed Peter's mother-in-law. And then that night, they brought them all. And he healed them all. I would assume that this was something he liked to do and planned to do. Let's go back to Matthew 9, the next chapter in Matthew, if you're still there. Verse 1. Getting into a boat, Jesus crossed over the sea and came to his own city. And they brought to him a paralytic lying on a bed. Seeing their faith, Jesus said to the paralytic, Take courage, son, your sins are forgiven. And some of the scribes said to themselves, This fellow blasphemes. And Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, Why are you thinking evil in your hearts? Which is it easier to say your sins are forgiven? Or get up and walk. But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, get up, take up your bed and go home. And he got up and he went home. Now, here's a question. Did the friends, we know from the other gospel that four friends carried him up to the top of the roof and everything. Did the friends want this man healed? <laughs> yeah, passionately. When they couldn't get him through the front door, they tore up the roof. Did they care about this man? Let me ask you this. Did Jesus want him healed? Yes. And did he care about Yeah. He bore the ridicule of those um, Pharisees that day in order to heal him. No. Man, this just goes on forever. If you go on down to um, verse 18, Jairus is coming up. You see, I want, if God chooses to heal some and not others, and you're seeing God, the Father reflected in Jesus, please show me the others he doesn't choose to heal. I'm going to show you so many that you might think he wants to heal everybody. Look at verse 18. While he was saying these things to them, a synagogue official came and bowed down before him and said, My daughter has just died, but come and lay your hands on her and she will live. And Jesus said, I'm really busy today. Is that what he said? No, he got up. What's his first reaction when somebody asks him for healing? Go. Go heal her. Now, you know that he gets delayed, but... um. And you know that the end of the story, even though it gets delayed, he raises her up, right? So in the meantime, a lady with your butt gets healed. Jairus' daughter gets raised from the dead. Go to verse 27. If I read them all, we'd be here till midnight, okay? So we're, we're going fast. Verse 27, as Jesus went on from there, two blind men followed, crying, Have mercy on the son of David. And when he entered the house, the blind men came up and said, Two of them, okay, you? You get to get healed? You? God will stay blind. You see, that's stupid. It's not any stupider than our theology. Now, please listen to one thing. If you don't want to get anything else today, if you ever decide that God chooses to heal some and not others, you'll always be one of the others he doesn't choose to heal. Always, because you never, ever have faith for healing until you know that you know that it is God's consummate desire, his overriding desire of his heart to see you whole, spirit, soul, and body. He went to the cross to see you healed. Hallelujah and whole. Amen. Hallelujah. No, let's read it, what it really happened. Verse 28, when he entered the house, the blind man came up. And Jesus said, do you believe I'm able to do this? And they said, yes, Lord. And he touched their eyes and said, it shall be done to you according to your faith. Now, if I told you that I had a vision this week and went to heaven, the Lord took me to heaven. While I was there, I saw tremendous ICUs and burn units, the fanciest wheelchairs you've ever seen. Amputees. Now, why do you, you know, you know why? Because that is anathema yeah. to the nature of God. The nature of God is wholeness. Yeah. He doesn't put a band-aid on you. No. You don't see any um, lifeguards next to the river of life. No. Can you see a lifeguard stand next to the river of life? No, you can't drown. I'm telling you, we have to get our minds renewed to a better kingdom. Because you can't drown in the river of life. One guy, he went through as a kid, Robert Slurton, and he swam in the river of life. And he said, it didn't matter what you want to do. And they can't drown, you can't die. If you step on a flower, it's alive. There's no death. Yeah. Let's go down to verse 35 in the same chapter. Jesus was going through all the cities and villages teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom. What's the good news of the kingdom? The good news is that the kingdom's here now. You can be born again now. You can transfer from darkness and sickness and sadness to life today. That's the good news. Yeah. And then what do you do after you proclaim the good news? He healed everybody that was the Father's will to heal. Right? No. Didn't put a qualifier on it. Read what it says. 
Read it with me. Jesus was going through all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness. We think some diseases are harder for God to heal. They're only harder for God to heal because it's harder for our medical profession to cure them. It, I'm respecting doctors. Good friend, this is a doctor. I go to a doctor when I have my shoulder dislocated. I'm grateful for a doctor. But my favorite doctor is Dr. Jesus. Because he has no needles and no bills and no knives. And I just think when he heals, it's so precious. Not, you know. Does it say that Jesus was healing 85% of sicknesses and diseases? No. Now a question. Was Jesus accomplishing exactly the Father's will? This will what was in the Father's heart. Was he doing exactly what he wanted to do when he came to earth to do this? Yeah. Was his will be carried out? And did he come to show us the kingdom? Whenever he healed, he showed us the kingdom of God. Because where God is in charge, people are happy. You just told me you don't buy my story of wheelchairs in heaven. You know why? Because in his, it's like this. Sickness can't stand in heaven now. No. Very well. Hallelujah. Now why would Jesus heal everything wrong with everybody? Everybody say because he wanted to. Well, yeah. Did they make it? No. Look at now here's a question for you. Look at the next chapter, Matthew 10. You're having easy today, not bouncing all over. We're almost done with this part, and we'll talk about why we leave me laying on a hands. Matthew 10. Jesus summoned his 12 disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and authority that carries over to heal every kind of disease and every kind of sickness. Now I have one question. Why would he give his disciples authority to heal every kind of disease and every kind of sickness? Pardon? Uh -huh. He wanted them healed. Yeah, he wanted to. He wanted people healed. Yeah. He's happy. Do you know that the people in here that got healed got happy? Yeah. I had someone when I was a kid that wouldn't even kill me. And um, I mean, I was trying to think of illustrations because we're talking in a minute. I mean, God hates it when people are hurt and robbed and face good health. You, I mean, a little two-year-old knows whether it's better to be sick and fat with a tummy ache or out playing. Yeah, a two-year-old is real clear on that. Yeah. When I was in the fifth grade, we had something called camp Campfire Girls instead of Girl Scouts, okay? A big uh, one entire year was spent getting ready for our camping trip. I mean, we raised some funds. We did everything. We learned it. Our camping skills. The day before our camping trip, I got the mumps. And I mean, I really had the mumps. And I, I, mean, I was swollen. I could hear it. It wasn't like you could try to fake it. I would try to shit my... And so every, the big event of the year. Now, that didn't ruin my life at all. But it ruined my month. Because... <laughs> and you say, that's not a big deal. I understand. But I know... People have been robbed of a whole lot more than that because of sickness and disease. God hates disease because the purpose of disease is to steal, kill, and destroy. Yeah. Why would he give his disciples um, authority to heal it? Because he wants people healed. Why aren't people healthy in heaven? Everybody say, because healthy is better than sick. I know this is profound. and you know, <laughs> If you can ever get it in your head, God wants me feeling good with energy and joy. You, you can resist the devil. God hates it when people are hurt and robbed in the days of good health. I mean, why would... Okay, here's a question. Does God want people healthy in heaven? Yeah. What did Jesus pray? Teach us to pray. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Yeah. I'm not praying for people to be sick when I pray that prayer. Or nor are you. You're praying for people to be healed. He hates it when people are robbed by of days of good health, and he can figure out what's good. It's just amazing. But Jesus knows as much as a two-year-old. Yeah. It's better to be out playing the sick and dead with a tummy ache. Day after day of arthritis pain is bad. Step and say, why are you even saying this? I want you to hate sickness. If you ever hate it like God hates it, you will resist it with everything in you. Yeah. Keith Moore said that he taught in healing school for years, and he said, I could tell Earl after a while, he said, I could almost tell you who's going to get healed and who wasn't. He said, okay, oh, the whiners and the, you know, what it, passive, yeah. they just kept their disease. But the fighters, uh -huh. if you've got a fighting spirit, and are you feisty? I'm not feisty usually, but no, I'm feisty, trust me. All right, it's just... 
It's good to be feisty in the spirit. Not toward people and not toward God, but toward the devil. You've got to get feisty and say, look it. If Jesus took it, I'm not paying the second time. Amen. It worked for you, right? I told Katie, oh, can I tell you your testimony or didn't it work? You know, she, she told me last Sunday, but last Sunday night, she said, my back's really hurting my back. And I said, you've got to tell the devil to get it off every time. So she texted me and she said, man, this has been working. Yeah, I know it works. I'm telling you this because it works. But, okay. After a while, you have to stand on your own two feet. I can't, I can't go to an and get healed every time now just because I know enough to tell the devil what to do with this junk. And, and, you, and you can do it too. Day after day of arthritis pain is bad. Listen, stacks and stacks of hospital and medical bills are bad. God wants to help you pay them, but how much better it is to learn to use our faith to stay healed and to help other people. You can be more of a blessing. How good is having a whole vacation without any of the kids sick? Yeah. Amen? So, question. Are we clear about what is good and what is evil? Is sickness good or evil? evil. What's its point? Steal, kill, and destroy. John 10, 10, Jesus said the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. Now look at Isaiah 5, 20. It says, woe to those who call evil good and good evil. Now what does that mean? Whoa. You know what that means? It means if you're going to call evil good and good evil, you're calling woes into your life. Woe to those who call good e evil good and good evil. You substitute darkness for light and light for darkness. You substitute bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. And you say, yes, but pastor, I was just running headlong for God. And I got in this accident. And when I was in, all four limbs were in traction. And I was looking up and I came to God. Thank God. Yeah. God loved you in the middle of the accident, before the accident. If you had wakened up before the accident, he would have taught you then. He'll teach you on the way to work tomorrow. You don't have to get in an accident and almost die. But he, yeah. My point is don't give credit to the stupid accident. Give credit to the Lord who was there willing to teach you when you woke up. God is willing to bring good out of anything because he loves you. But his best is to avoid accident. And okay, here's the point. He said, well, what's the big deal about all this? Brother Hagen had a lady. I told him to give me some pictures of Brother Hagen. Never heard before. What a treat. He had a lady that come up to him, and she really wanted to get healed. He said, Sister, you really want to get healed. And, and she said, yeah. And he says, why? She said, I want to ride motorbikes with my husband again. And he says, there's nothing wrong with that. But it's not supposed to be the primary reason for them to get healed. Do you know how much you can do for the kingdom of God when you're sick all the time? I mean, I'm, if when you live with somebody with a life-threatening it illness, that becomes the issue of life. Yeah. Yeah. Not the salvation of souls. I'm sorry. When you have a life-threatening issue or illness, that's your purpose in life to get rid of it. That's yeah. all you can think about. Yeah. But when you're healthy and your life is not, or your health is not even an issue at all, you've got time. It's okay to ride motorbikes with your husband, but your purpose is to get people saved. There's people going to hell. Yeah. And there's not any reason because if the gospel is preached, people will get saved. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. All right, so what does calling evil good bring into our lives? Woes. And you say, why woes? Because you get so confused, you don't know what you believe. And you're so, you can ultimately get so confused, you confuse God and the devil. Uh -huh. yeah. And you say, how do you know? Because I've had people come to me for counseling and say, I just don't know why the Lord allowed this. And I want to save them, but you can't because they're hurting. But you want to say, he didn't, you did? I've had lots of things in my life. God didn't allow it, I did. Yeah. Through my ignorance, through, through dumb mistakes, yeah. dumb choices. God wants to bring us, you know, I know it's quiet in here right now. Oh, Let me tell you the upside to this. The downside, and you can feel people feeling it, is you have responsibility. Yeah. Now, I don't think it's fair to explain about healing without explaining. One of the best days of my life was when I found out that there isn't any part of my life that doesn't affect my health. My being mad will affect my health, okay? On. Cheating on your taxes will affect your health. How can that affect your health? I'll tell you how it affects your health. You have a hedge around you. It's called the glory of God. 
And when you compromise that hedge around you through immorality, through dishonesty, through just sheer disobedience, when you know God told you to do one thing and you're doing something else, you compromise that hedge of glory and it will affect your physical health. And I'm going to say, all you're saying, there's condemnation. Somebody said, no, there, there's, 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 there's sickness that comes just as an attack, okay? Nobody, I went to church once, you couldn't go if you had a cold because everybody looked down on you. Now that's sick. That's stupid. The greatest of these is not faith. The greatest is love. Yeah. But you need to understand. You see, I do not believe that you can go pour sugar in your tank and then take it back to GM and say, you made this wrong. Come on. If you're going to put sugar in your tank, they didn't make it wrong. You fed it wrong. Yeah. Now, this isn't popular in America. But I know what goes in my body because I am accountable to God for the temple of the Holy Spirit. And you, I know I wouldn't smoke just because anybody in their right mind with the research done today knows what smoking does. There's not condemnation. Yes, you can go to heaven and smoke. I'm not saying you can't go to heaven and smoke. You can. But how much longer you live on this earth if you don't smoke, okay? Now listen, if there is an obligation not to abuse substances and alcohol, which there is, and not to smoke, then I believe you have, and this is very unpopular with teenagers and my always young, not good looks for my teenagers, but there will come a day you will have to back off from the fast food. You can't live on Big Macs for 50 years and stay healthy. They're not out to keep you healthy, they're out to make your money, keep, get your money, okay? Okay, I want, this is not the message to tell, but I still say that it is hypocritical to tell me I'd never feed my legs to sugar, but I would feed meat. And I'm not saying I don't need any sugar. I'm not crazy vegetarian or anything else. But <laughs> partially hydrogenated oils are good for you. Now you're going to get mad at me for telling you that. True research tells truth. You, I'm not saying you have to be a, a fanatic, but at least be aware of what's going in your body. You can get another Lexus if you're rich enough, but you can never get it. This is the, I'm sorry, this is the most valuable piece of real estate. I don't care if you own a whole island in the Caribbean. That is not the most valuable piece of real estate you own. This is the most. When you get evicted from this real estate, you're out of here. You will not help one more soul make it to heaven. And you say, I think I should eat whatever I want. Well, like I say, I'm not a crazy health food nut, but we did really research. And I can't get this. It's not a popular thing. How many of you would agree that if you found me putting sugar in your tank after service, you would have an issue with your pastor? Come on, honestly. Now, which is more valuable to you? That thing you drive or the only earth suit you have in the planet. You can't get another one. You talk to people in the ICU up there. Nothing matters but this earth suit and, and staying here. Well, you have an obligation first of all to get in the Bible and find out if what I'm telling you is the truth because Jesus healed all the way through the New Testament. And I'm, t I'm just going to tell you you don't have to like it. But it does matter what you eat. And if it's wrong to smoke cigarettes, it's wrong to eat all junk food because you cannot stay healthy. Right. Amen. Look at uh, the same chapter in Isaiah, one verse, 5.13. It's not in my notes, but it sure is sensible. It sure is sensible. If you would guard your gas tank, why wouldn't you guard? Amen. Therefore, this is the Lord speaking, my people go into exile. That means they don't live in the promised land. Whatever they... Whenever they went to exile, they were leaving the promised land, right, Canaan? My people don't live in the promised land for their lack of knowledge. They're honorable but are famished in their mouth. It is a lack of knowledge that has kept the church from getting healed and staying healed. Okay? All right. Let me read it. We'll get back on the track here because I'm clear off track. The Bible is very clear that we have been bequeathed a twofold redemption. Our sins were put on Jesus at the cross. Our sicknesses at the living post. Jesus came to show us the Father. And every place he went, people became whole. So we must conclude that the Father's heart is for you to be whole. Yeah. Well, let me ask you this. It says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. How many know that? He, he was okay. That means Jesus Christ is the same. 30 AD, 2012, yeah. and throughout eternity. Uh -huh. Here's a question. In 30 AD, did he want people whole? Yeah, yeah, yeah quick. In eternity, you've already told me you don't buy my vision of going to heaven. Okay. In eternity, does he want you whole? Yeah. 
Jesus Christ is the same, 30 AD, 2012, and eternity. Yeah. Has he changed in 2012 that he wants you sick today? Come on. Did you know that all three persons of the Godhead are in the healing? Look at Acts 10, 38. The Apostle Paul said, you know of Jesus of Nazareth. No, it was Peter. I'm sorry. Peter said this. You know of Jesus of Nazareth, how God anointed him with the Holy Spirit and with power, who went, who, how he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed to the devil, for God was with him. Five questions. Number one, who did the anointing? God. Did he want people healed? Must have. Number two, um, with whom did the Father anoint Jesus? With the Holy Spirit. So for God the Father, God the Holy Spirit are in on this. Do he do healing and doing good go together? He went about doing good and healing. If somebody if somebody prays for you and get healed, have they done you good? Yeah. Who did the healing? Jesus. Yes. Who did the oppressing? Okay, I'm going to slow down. Yeah, yeah. Let's read again. You know Jesus of Nazareth, how God anointed the Holy Spirit with power, and how he went about doing good and healing. Jesus did the healing of all who were oppressed by whom? Now, if Jesus did the healing and the devil did the oppressing then, who does the healing today? Who does the oppressing? God never put sickness on you. He said he wanted, and you said he wanted to teach me something. He sent two things to be your teacher. This holy word and God the Holy Spirit. And if he gets, if in the middle of a sickness he gets your attention, he'll always teach you. But he didn't want you to have to hurt to get taught. I never beat on my kids before I set them down to do homeschool. No, I'm serious. I homeschool my kids, but I just want to teach them. I don't want to hurt them. I mean, figure out who God is and who the devil is. It's important. Many times, think about this. The moment people... I'm, I'm not trying to be rude. I'm just... The moment people asked Jesus to come heal, what did he say? Here he was on his way. He was walking. He was coming to heal. Many times, Jesus takes the initiative to heal without a word being said to him. Go to Mark 3. Yeah. He's on the here. Oh, I wanted to get to laying on of hands. One of these tapes I was listening to my brother Hagen says, the reason, people reason don't believe, the reason people don't believe in laying on of hands is they've never been taught why we do it. I thought, I didn't know that. I, how many of you know that you're born in this world knowing absolutely nothing? I was astonished as a mother. You have to teach them everything. Yeah. <laughs> One of these days, it'll be your turn. I'm sorry, guys. <laughs> yeah, I'll tell you something. My mommy had to learn me at all. If you learn me everything. <laughs> but you see, the reason, it's easy if you've walked with God for a long time to think, well, they have to know that. That's easy. I got taught it. I'm going to teach you why we believe in laying on hands. It's real clear in the scripture. Okay, Mark chapter 3, 1 and 2. He entered into a synagogue and a man was there with whose hand was withered. And they were watching him to see if he, could, he would heal him on the Sabbath so that they might accuse him. Oh my, wasn't this lovely? They cared so much or so little for this man. They didn't say, oh, I wonder if Jesus is going to heal this man so he can go back to work and support his family. Come on. All they wanted to do was find her. Now this is really uh, lame. And he said to the man with the withered hand, get up and come forth. How, who's asking to heal anybody? I wonder if he wanted to. And he said to them, is it lawful to do good or to do harm on the Sabbath? So what is he calling healing here? Good. Doing good. Yeah. Is it lawful to do good or to do harm on the Sabbath? To save your life or to kill it? Or, and the big have silent. Now if you're looking at them with anger, uh -oh. read that their hardness of heart, he said to them, the man, stretch out your hand. And he stretched it out and it was... His hand was restored. Now, why was he grieved? Because they cared so little for the man, and he cared so much. Yeah. I want you to say that. They cared so little. They cared so little. He, cared so much. he cared so much. Now, tell the person sitting next to you, Jesus cares, Jesus cares. about your being made whole. Go to Luke 13. This is one of those messages, honestly, if you got it walked out, you wouldn't hurt my feelings. I just, I, a couple things, I just want you to, you understand that what you see in one message can change your, your life for the rest of your life? Yeah. Look at Luke 13. Same thing happened. He was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath, and there was a woman who was, for 18 years, had a sickness caused by a spirit. And she was bent double and could not straighten at all. Everybody said, that's uncomfortable. When Jesus saw her, he called her over and said to her, Woman, you are free from your sickness. Did she ask? Why did he call her up and say he loved her? 
Why would he heal you? Yeah, because he wants to. He loves you. Yeah. And he laid his hands on her, and immediately she was made erect again and began glorifying God. But the synagogue officials, indignant because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, began saying to the crowd in response, there are six days in which work should be done. Come during them and get healed on the Sabbath. But the Lord answered and said to him, You hypocrite, does not each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or donkey from the stall and lead him away to water him? Now this is what the Lord gave me this morning. And I thought, well, that's unique. How many of you own an ox? How many of you own a donkey? See, then we, that's why we don't relate to this. This is, the, this is the version for Colonial Beach in 2012. He said, you hypocrites. If you had a dog that was sick, you'd take him to the bed. And, yet you, and you wouldn't worry about whether it was God's will for your little puppy to get healed. I said, if your dog was sick, you'd take him to the bed. And you wouldn't pray over whether it was God's will for Rover to get healed. I'm not being mean. Think of this. Sickness is not good. Healing's good. Yeah. I have a 13-year-old Pomeranian I love dearly, and I'd be glad to take her to the vet. Sheila keeps her in real good health. But I'm telling you, I would not ask God if it was, I would know it was the devil making my dog sick. Yeah. Well, if we can figure out it's the devil making the dog sick, then we ought to know that whatever is on our body that is not, like in the Garden of Eden, is not of God. Yeah. And look at verse 16. He says, this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom she is, whom Satan has bound for 18 long years. Now, first of all, did she have a right to get healed? Yes, because under the Abrahamic covenant, they were promised, I am the Lord, your healer, Jehovah Rapha. So as a daughter of Abraham, she had a right. Number two question, who oppressed her? If you have had back pain for 10 years, it is the oppression from the devil. I promise you it didn't come from God. Jesus Christ is the same, 30 AD, 2012, and throughout eternity. If he was outraged that she had had that for 18 long years, he'd be outraged if he knew you have suffered with back pain for even two months. Now listen, Jesus is not a reluctant healer. He no. paid for your, for your redemption. I'm not going to get to show you the legal part. It's in Isaiah 53. We're going to spend one more time on healing. I am absolutely convinced that if you get healing to where you know it, your bone marrow, you will be so outraged by sickness and disease on your body or on anybody you love that you will go after it like a cockroach. Yeah. How many of you like cockroaches in your house? How many of you would take the, the termite person? And you don't have to say anything, John. I know what you think of cockroaches. That's just good. How many of you would it take extreme measures to rid your house from cockroaches? Okay. Well, your body is nothing but the house you live in. Your spirit lives in your body. And we ought to hate everything, everything, everything. Again, I'm down to allergies. And Flonase is taking care of my allergies, so I haven't been fighting it. But you know, I think it would please God if I just decided to fight that too. Because... It is an honor. It is glorious. Every time you get healed. Look at verse 17. As he said this, all his opponents were being humiliated. And the entire crowd was rejoicing over the glorious. A woman like this for 18 years. She stands up and the crowd goes nuts. How glorious. Every time you get healed. When Margie was healed for the last week. That gives glory to God. Hallelujah. Now. Laying on of hands is not, we can either put this off till next week. Can you give me five minutes more? Yeah. Yeah. Laying on of hands is not the only way to be healed, but it is one way. Yeah. Now, oh, I'm missing a page of notes. Oh, I'm turn to. I want to show you, um, look at four times that laying on of hands is shown in the new scriptures with me really fast. Matthew 19 to 30, verse 13, Jesus laid hands on the children. Here's, okay, here's why we don't believe in laying on hands. Everybody listen. If you believed one thing, you would understand laying on the hands. There are two realms that we operate in simultaneously. Because of um, intellectualism and, and everybody just believe in the natural world only, we believe that world. You don't see it, you know, they deny the spirit and everything else. There's a spiritual realm. When Jesus, look at what happened here. So some of the children were brought to him so that he might lay hands on them and pray. And the disciples rebuked him. Next verse. But Jesus said, let the children alone. Don't hinder them from coming to me, for the kingdom belongs to such as these. Now watch what he does. And laying his hands on them, he departed from there. 
Now, what happened when he laid his hands on them? Was this just a cute gesture? No. You see, we see this aw, aw, you know, cute gesture. No. Something real transpired when he laid hands on them. Something real was imparted. He imparted the blessing and goodness and, and yeah. presence of God into their lives. You see that? When, yeah. We're going to lay hands on Skip and Nancy to send them out Wednesday. Yeah. And we intend to impart the favor and protection and blessing with all our faith that we got, okay? So number one, they laid hands on to bless. Acts 18. Look, look at why they laid hands here. In 18, I'm sorry, Acts chapter 8, verse 14. Acts 8, 14. Now when the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent them Peter and John, who came down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit, for he had not yet fallen on any of them. They had simply been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Now how did they get them filled with the Spirit? Then they began laying hands upon their, on them and receiving the Holy Spirit. The best way to understand this, I think it was the Andrew Womack used this, but it's just jumper cables. If I have been a place in my life where I was so exhausted, so down spiritually, that I would go to somebody that knew how to stronger anointing, they lay hands and they're literally imparting strength. You can get filled with the Holy Spirit. I've been filled and we prayed and laid hands on you because of the anointing on that life. It's a transference. Yeah. It's a transference. Okay, Acts 9, look what happened when, remember, next chapter, verse 17, Paul went blind after he saw the um, light on the way to Damascus and saw the Lord. The Lord spoke to a man named Ananias at 9, 17. So Ananias departed and entered the house, and after laying his hands on them, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road by which you were coming, has sent me that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. So he laid hands, and what happened? Immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales and regained his sight. We know he got filled with the Spirit because later he said, I'm speaking tongues more than you all. So he laid hands on him, and two things happened. Paul received the Holy Spirit. When you, if, if you don't want to lay hands on somebody to get them healed, it's because you don't think that healer lives in you. And it's all right, you just haven't been taught. But how much better would it be to have healing available to somebody? Amen? So first we saw Jesus laying hands on to bless. Then we send them laying hands on to be filled with the Spirit. Here we see Ananias get, um, laying hands on to heal. And they get filled with the Spirit. Now where did Ananias get this method of healing? Look at Mark 16. Jesus is talking. He said, go into all the world and preach the good news to all creation. The next verse I gave you, I think it's 17. These signs will accompany those who believe. How many believers do we have? Believers. Okay, you pop on. Yeah. They'll cast out demons. They'll speak with new tongues. They'll pick up servants. Servants. That doesn't mean that you go around looking for servants to pick up. Like when when Paul was gathering wood for the fire and he saw a viper attached, they thought he get he just shook it off. No problem. Yeah. If, if they if you if somebody tries to poison you, it's not going to hurt you. Man. They will do what to the sick. They'll put the jumper cable on the sick. They'll lay hands and pray, and that and that um, healing is transferred. Okay, we can't do everything here, but I want to show you one more scripture. Hebrews 6, 1 and 2 lists the six basic doctrines of the church. Let's look at it. It says, therefore, leaving the elementary teaching about Christ. He's telling the Hebrews, you've already learned these things. Now let's go on. Yeah. What are the elementary doctrines? It says, let us press on to maturity, not laying again, one, a foundation of repentance from dead works. That means trying to be good enough for God. Two, faith toward God. Three, instruction about washings. Could you flip this over to New King James? It, talks, it says it's baptisms. Right. It, I'll be on the translation, but New American Standard practically. I like New American Standard, but I don't think it gets it right here. It says, it says instruction about baptisms, laying on of hands. Oh, uh, well, you want to just believe me? I was on my iPad, but it is baptisms in New King James. Anybody have New King James? Can, yes. Yeah, and it says baptisms, right, Chris? Yes. All right. Laying on of hands is the fourth basic doctrine of the church, resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. Do you see that? Okay. There's New King James. Read it with me. Of the doctrine of baptisms, laying on of hands, resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. Thank you, John. Do you have that list? Here's the six. What I want you to see is if you see that I grew up in a, in a bright church and we didn't lay on hands, I want you to see that the, the writer of Hebrews, I believe it's the Apostle Paul, we don't know for sure, the writer of Hebrews said, there's six basic doctrines you've got. Now, now it's time to go into maturity. This is the yeah. basic elementary doctrines of the church. 
There are six of them. I am willing to bet you right now that no matter what church you grew up in, you, you went with five of them at least. Okay? How many of you taught you to repent to get right with God? Raise your hand. You, your church taught you to repent. Okay? How many of you taught you to have faith in God? Even if you're Baptist, whatever. Okay, faith in God. Right. How many of you talked about some kind of baptism? They've been into baptism, believers' baptism, but y'all talked about baptism. Okay? Skip number four. Number five. How many of you, your, your church taught you there is coming a day when you go to heaven and the, the dead will be raised? Everybody, right? Number six. How many of you believe that Hitler will be judged? In your church that you were taught that sin will ultimately be judged. How many of you would have to agree that at least five of those basic doctrines were taught in your Orthodox church? I'm trying to help you to see that we are Orthodox. We're just put, covering the gamut of what the a writer of Hebrews said. Yeah. The fourth was laying on of hands. Yeah. Jesus laid hands on people when he healed them. Three minutes. Just, let's just buzz through these last scriptures, Don. Matthew 9, 27. When he healed the... the Okay, so Jesus went on from there, two blind men, following them, crying out, Have mercy on us, son of David. When he entered the house, the blind men come up, and Jesus said, What do you want me to do? Or do you believe I'm able to do this? They said to him, Yes, Lord, they can come up here. And he touched their eyes. Now, we don't think of this as laying on of hands, but watch this. He said, Do you believe that I can do this? And so he touched their eyes. Now, what do we call that? Uh -huh. Don't we call that the laying on of hands? Yeah. yeah, stand right there. We may need you again. <laughs> He's valuable. He's valuable. You're great. We, 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 we. Mark 140 to 42. Oh, that is it. And the leper came to Jesus, beseeching him and falling on his knees before him, saying, If you're willing, you can make me clean. The move of compassion, Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him. And he said, I am willing. Be cleansed. Didn't he touch him? What do you think we did? He said, we call it different. He touched him. He's laying on hands. Is he not, Phil? I'm laying hands on him. That's how we pray for people. And you say, oh, I don't know. That's a strange doctrine. It's listed in the same basic elementary six, yeah. along with eternal judgment and faith toward God and resurrection of the dead, repentance. What was the fifth one I missed? Whatever. Those are the basic doctrines of the church in laying on hands. Let's just do one more. You can't be Peter's mother in law. Let you sit down. Okay. <laughs> Matthew 8, 14, he saw his mother-in-law like sick with a fever, and it says he touched her. He laid his hand on her head and prayed for her. All right, what's the point, Pastor? Okay, hey, you want to know something cool that I had thought about? You know that when the slave, Peter cut his ear off the, in the Garden of the Summoning, remember that? He laid hands on him and healed him. He says he touched him and healed the ear. Okay, what's the point? When you lay hands on someone, you're simply transferring the power of God from you to them. Brother Hagin said one thing is awfully important, and we don't have time to, but if Jesus hadn't gone to the cross, my laying hands on Christiana wouldn't heal her. Yeah. You understand? It, it, just laying hands on somebody's not going to heal them. But the fact that legally he paid for your sins and the devil does not have a right, you can get healed without anybody laying hands on you, okay? But... If, if somebody does lay hands on you, what they're doing is they're imparting the power of God into your life. Yeah. Hallelujah. I want to say one last thing. You can get all, you can go overboard with every doctrine in the, in the church. Okay? And Brother Hagin always said this. He said, the devil, here's the truth, and there's a dish on this side, and there's a dish on that side. Yeah. The devil does not care which ditch he gets you into. All right? I want to give you one caution on laying on hands. I always know, I wouldn't let anybody I didn't know lay hands on me. And you say, well, that's arrogant. No, no, I would not let anybody I don't know lay hands on me. You say, why? Because you have to understand there's a spiritual world, right? Yeah. When Jesus blessed the children, he wasn't being cute about it, trying to make it feel good. He blessed them, the goodness of God. He had the hope, okay? Yeah. There can be a transference of unholy spirits as much as there can be a transference of Holy Spirit. Nobody is ever going to stand in this pulpit that ministers confusion. If they're not, if they're fuzzy on what they believe, bless you, but you're not going to stand in this pulpit because you're going to minister confusion to my people. You're being ministers. If you don't like me at all, you really shouldn't be ministers. <laughs> no, the anointing on me is going to get on you. Yeah. All right? That's why some of you have more faith for healing than before you came. The anointing, okay. I would never allow 
And I'm saying this because it never fits in any message. I don't know if it's in this message, but you need to hear. I would never allow a ministry that I knew had been in immorality and lay hands on me. Why? Because the spirit of adultery can be transferred just like as a whole, the Holy Spirit. These are, this is a real world, and we're talking about real influence and real impartation. I would, I would never let somebody that is... Have you ever seen a preacher that was so arrogant? You just wondered how they even managed to get their way through life. They're so arrogant. Okay, I mean, I re we all fight pride. That's our number one enemy. But some people give way to it. I want to let that person lay hands on me. But if somebody... It sounds really negative, but that's what said Paul or Timothy. He said, don't even lay hands on people too occasionally. You can partake in their sin. If they haven't repented, you should wait till they repent before you lay hands on them. Because it's a powerful thing. Yeah. 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 And now I've got you scared to let, when John Rotten comes, anytime he'll lay hands on you. Lay, yeah. If he ever wants to pray for like his, lay hands. When Tal Papa Dallas was here, somebody you know walks with God, yeah. walks upright, has faith, has clarity in the spirit, has revelation. You want that person to pray for you. Because of some of these names I want to put out here, you may not even know, but you know Smith Wigglesworth was probably the mightiest man of God since the Apostle Paul. He raised many, many people from the dead. He was a plumber in Wales, got filled with the Holy Spirit and, and until he was 80-some years old when he traveled the whole globe seeing miracles. Listen, when he was, when Leonard, uh, Lester Sumrall, now a lot of you wouldn't even know Lester Sumrall, great man of God, powerful anointing, powerful deliverance anointing. When he was a very young man, he walked into Smith Wigglesworth's house just to visit him. And he said, you're going, and he began to prophesy, and then he said, let me lay hands on you. And he imparted this mighty anointing. Now, I don't think you can get a whole anointing without paying a price. But you do receive something special when a man or woman of God lays hands on you and blesses you. Yeah. So, what I've been trying to do today is, first of all, wrap up the fact, all the way through the Old Testament, God loved to heal. Well, and listen, this one last thing, i got to say this. You have to understand that when deciding whether God wants to heal, you are deciding on the very nature of God. If you told me I wanted my kids sick and paralyzed, I'd cry. i cry. I would just say, you don't know how much I love my kids. If you told me you, I, would, you, I wanted you guys sick, I'd cry. I'd pray for you. Then the question becomes, is God good enough and bright enough to know good for me? Don't tell me sickness is good. Sickness is an abomination. It robs, doesn't it, Michelle? It robs. God wants you healed, sweetheart. She said fibromyalgia. I just want you to know that right now, we, and you say, why don't we pray more and lay hands on more? I'll tell you a couple of reasons. One, we're afraid of embarrassment. We're afraid, what if we... I, I'm not going to be afraid. I'm going to attack sickness and disease until it does go. Because yeah. God doesn't want you hurting no, no, getting out of bed in the morning. Can I pray for you right now? I don't know what's in plan. Yeah. And you don't have to. But I, I just don't think God wants her suffering one more year with fibromyalgia. Amen. We love you. Yeah. And I know he loves you way more because I don't know if I love you enough to die for you. He did. Yeah. Now it wouldn't make any sense for Jesus Christ to go through the utter agony if you saw the the uh, passion of the Christ. That was not an exaggeration. No. That was the truth. I've heard some people say it was an understatement. I don't know how much you could state it. Why would he do it? Because he wanted passionately for you to be whole in this life. He didn't just pay. Would you like me to lay hands on you and pray right now? Would you like to come up? I mean, look at it this way. We're not going to make it any worse. Because you have to take a lot of medication. I don't know, honey. I just, my heart, I got up right now. I'm so angry at all sickness. Yeah. You believe Jesus died for you? Yeah. And you're born again in his child. You know he loves you enough to heal you? You know he's got plenty of power to heal you? Why don't anybody that wants to help me pray just come on up and let's lay hands on me and pray? Because I, I don't like things that we're all. Father, we thank you for your show. We thank you for your blood. We thank you for her love for you and her devotion to you despite the pain. And I thank you she recognizes that this foul disease did not come from you. And right now we come against fibromyalgia. There is written that in the name of Jesus every knee will bow. And that includes fibromyalgia. And we demand that fibromyalgia bow its knee over Michelle Anino's body now in Jesus' name. 
we demand that you take your symptoms and your pain and you go. And then, Father, right now we release the healing anointing of our precious Lord Jesus Christ, the virtue, the wholeness of God himself into her body. We ask you to effect a cure, to undo everything this disease has done. Any place has ravished her body, oh, Father, in Jesus' name, restore. Let your healing power flow. May she be 100% whole. And here's what you do. You know that if we asked Jesus to touch you, he did. And we know that it took a while for you to get in the place physically you are. We know that if the doctors gave you medicine, it might take some time. We're going to believe that God touched you right now. Yeah. And just say thank you, Lord, that at noon on, on April 22nd, you touched my life. Thank you. And I'm going to believe God with you that you are free from this thing forever. Have a good life. Joy life.